Good evening. This is Donna Blomquist, librarian at the LaSalle Public Library, welcoming you to tonight's virtual program, Medewin National Tallgrass Prairie, part two. Before we begin, a note about three upcoming programs. Next Tuesday, March 8th at 6 p.m., the library will virtually host author and historian William Hazelgrove when he presents 160 Minutes, The Race to Save the HMS Titanic, a program based on his book of the same title. This program is an interesting take on this historic event in that it focuses not on the sinking, but instead on the rescue, much credited to the wireless operators who feverishly sent messages back and forth to organize a rescue mission. This year marks the 110th commemoration of the Titanic disaster. On Saturday, March 12th at 11 a.m., join us for a special presentation made possible by the Daughters of the American Revolution for Du Rocher chapter. Author Kate Moore will be meeting with us virtually to discuss her best-selling New York Times and USA Today, Today book, The Radium Girls. Kate is an excellent researcher and engaging storyteller. In this book, set in the period near the end of the First World War, Kate relates the true story of how young women factory workers discovered too late the poisonous effects of working with radium-infused paint. The book documents their struggle to receive medical care and compensation and further underscores how this event was an early step in improving conditions for factory workers. And on Tuesday, March 15th at 6 p.m., the library will virtually host author and historian Cynthia Clampett when she presents Destination Heartland History. While the greater Midwest is known for its food production, it actually supplies so much more. Find out about the legendary individuals and the inventions that changed the world all from the heartland. Cynthia has written several books and been a guest presenter at the library for her book-based programs, Midwest Maze and Yo-Ho-Ho and a Bottle of Rum, both works that connect history through food, and Waltzing Australia, a look at the flora, fauna, and geography of Australia. We hope you will join us for all of these programs. And now for tonight's special presentation about Madewa National Tallgrass Prairie. Our speaker tonight is historian and archeologist, Joe Wheeler. And just a reminder to our audience, please post your questions in the chat. Veronica Hankey, site leader at Medewin, will respond to the chat during the presentation and Joe will answer any other questions at the end. Joe, welcome. Thank you, Donna. I, uh, I'm glad to be here. Had a relatively uh, short, uh, upper, short heads up opportunity. We got back from annual leave to, uh, uh, to do this and I was really excited to do it. So uh, you'll see my excitement soon as I try to cram everything I know uh, into, into an hour. So I think we should probably just go ahead and get started on that. And as Donna said, I'm uh, Joe Wheeler. I'm the archeologist and uh, heritage program manager and uh, tribal liaison at Medewa National Tallgrass Prairie. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time tonight about uh, covering things that were covered by Veronica in part one, kind of the, all the details about Medewin. You know, I think at this point, Medewin is about 50 miles east of uh, LaSalle. And we'd surely be happy to have you all come up, uh, come up the river a little ways and visit us. Uh, always open, 365 days a year. And uh, we're, uh, we're excited to get the opportunity to talk to folks in LaSalle. The only thing I will recover, which I know Veronica covered a week ago in part one, is the establishment of a day when, when it was turned over from the Army, from what had been the Joliet Army Ammunition Plant, to the USDA Forest Service in 1996 under the provisions of uh, the Illinois Land and Conservation Act of 1995. It told us to do four things uh, when we took the, that land. And uh, the first was to conserve and enhance native populations and habitats of fish, wildlife, and plants. So a little quick analysis, mission analysis there was the only way to do that is to embark on an ambitious, very ambitious, uh, one roughly 100 year restoration process. And we're 26 years into it this year. So uh, we're, we're under the gun. We've only got 74 years left. Also providing opportunities for scientific, environmental and land use education and research. This 
is a part of that. And the work I do as the archaeologist uh, with partners, with many really good partners, uh, we'll talk about a little bit, uh, helps to further that effort. Also allow the uh, continued use for agriculture of the land. We have uh, about 5,000 acres each in row crop and in uh, grazing. And we run about 1,000 cattle during grazing season. They'll be coming back pretty soon after we finish uh, prairie burns, uh, probably in April. Also uh, providing an opportunity of recreational, a variety of recreational opportunities. And we certainly have that, which uh, Veronica covered last week. So I grew up in Illinois. I was gone for about 40 years uh, in the middle of my life, and now I'm back. But I remember what I knew when I returned was what we'd all been taught in schools. That is, there was the glaciers 10,000 years ago. The glaciers, uh, glacier episode ended. The Wisconsin glacial episode ended. And the prairie came, and then the bison came, and then drawn by the bison, the people came, lived lightly on the land until European Americans came, turned it into farmland. And in the case of Medewin, the army came, fought, they fought the Second World War II, for, uh, fought Second World War II, in a manner of speaking, from southwestern Will County. And now we're here to restore the land to what it had been until just a couple of short centuries ago. And it's not quite like that. So what I did learn in many years, I was out of the state was we need a little need a little evidence. We need to examine some of these things. So uh, I'm going to challenge you a little bit with our shorthand understanding that that I certainly had of uh, of the history of the land of Medewin. So of course the tall grass prairie had been here. Native Americans were here from about 10,000 years ago until 1832, uh, a little after 1832, when uh, Indian Removal Act was put into effect. <laughs> Following that was the European agricultural, uh, Euro-American agricultural era. On the day when that lasted for about 110 years, 1830 to 1940, when the army bought the land. And you can see in the lower right-hand corner, that doesn't look like farmland anymore. And uh, that's what the land looked like from 1940 to 96. And honestly, what a lot of it still looks like. But in the lower left-hand corner, you can see what we're hoping to restore it to through the efforts of you, the taxpayer, of we, the Forest Service. Uh, thank you for that. So let's start with the glacier part. It wasn't 10,000 years ago. I always thought, well, 10,000 years ago, the glaciers were. Well, it turned out that, in fact, the glacial episode, which began about 85,000 years ago, really started to recede about 25 to 21,000 years ago. And the land of LaSalle, was uncovered from glacial cover about 21,000 years ago. So more than double what I had thought and 18,000 years ago in the day one. And how do I know this? Well, let's look at the lines of evidence. This is a fun site if you get a chance to look at it. It's the Neotoma Paleoecology Paleo Database, international database, but it was founded by, started by several members of the uh, University of Illinois and Illinois State Museum staff. So you can get to it at apps.neotomadb.org. And what's a neotoma? Why neotoma? You see that little critter in the center. A pack rat is a neotoma. It's a genus neotoma in a number of species of that genus. And in here, they put all sorts of paleoecological data. And you can see in the lower left, that box tells you the sorts of databases you can find in the Otomo Paleoecology database. But the part that I like, I highlighted in yellow, which is the Explorer. And one of the things that the Explorer, this is a screen capture from it, and you can look at the ice cover, and ice and lakes cover historically, prehistorically as the case may be, uh, over time in certain increments by just uh, tapping on the map screen and zooming down to where you're interested in. So 21,100 years ago is what I selected, and that's where the glaciers were. LaSalle was ice-free as of about 21,100 years ago. Midday went still well under possibly hundreds of meters of ice at that time. But it didn't take very long. It ran at about, receded, uh, actually melted back at 276.2 feet a year. And by 18,000 years ago, roughly, most of Medewin was ice-free. And you can see the outline of uh, Lake Michigan to give you some perspective between LaSalle 
and uh, I outlined in blue where the modern um, Lake Michigan Lakeshore is now. One of the data sets in there is critical to our understanding of the history of the land around here. Uh, it, is the, uh, it is the North American pollen database and the study of pollen is palynology and it is a terrific insight to what previous environments were like. In the 2006 article by Nelson, Bottom Center, uh, which you can get a copy of Ecology uh, Journal, and uh, they looked at Volo Bog, Nelson Lake, and Chetsworth Bog, and uh, all of those are important. Uh, Nelson Lake and Chetsworth Bog are important because they, on the right, you'll see the natural divisions of Illinois by John Schweigman, a map of that. And all of those three sites, not Volo Bog, however, are on the uh, Grand Prairie subdivision. So they were all on the natural uh, division called the Grand Prairie, the Tall Grass Prairie, the Great Prairie, whatever you wish to call it. And they're about equidistant north and south from the Daywin. So we can take a look at the data sets from there and it gives us some really good insights as to environmental history. So palynology, study of pollen grains and spores as found in archeological and geological deposits. And on the lower left, you see a pond with the typical dust or palms, pond scum on it, which is mostly made up of pollen. That sinks to the bottom of the pond. And in the case of Nelson Lake, this is a picture of Eric Grimm from Illinois State, late Eric Grimm and uh, some of his uh, uh, colleagues from Illinois State Museum uh, doing cores. They take cores in the wintertime. This is way too hard to do from a rocking boat in the summer, as you might guess. It pulls up a core through that muck on the bottom of the pond. And uh, you can see when they push it out of the core, out of the pipe, you see all those horizontal lines in that photograph of the exposed core. And of course that uh, corresponds to, you know, nearer the top of those core samples is closer to the present. And the deeper you go, the further you are in the past, the law of superimposition. And what do they see? When they take these wafer thin slices of pond muck, pond bed muck, uh, you get pollen. It's not as pristine and pretty as this uh, pictures that I have here. It's kind of muzzy and broken up. But if you get uh, like a bog or a fen and you have low oxygen and cold temps, it can give you some, uh, it can retain some, some integrity to those pollen samples. You see they're all pretty distinctive. Uh, grass, the poaceae, uh, seldom can you get down to species, but you can get to genus uh, in many cases. Grass uh, pollen kind of looks like a cantaloupe. And then you have this kind of bloated rectangle, which is ash tree pollen. Uh, ragweed looks as evil as it is to uh, many of us who have hay fever. And uh, you can also see it in the field of the very, the color, the stained and uh, uh, the pictures of the pollen there, you can see some grassy, uh, grass pollen in there as well as some uh, ambrosia pollen in there. Uh, also uh, spruce, uh, very distinctive, and then this kind of bloated triangle of, uh, of uh, oak pollen. So you can see what you have. So let's put those together. So if you have a core and you can date it, and by the way, in between, because we have a lot of fire on the prairie and always have, uh, you get uh, carbon, you get ash and carbon that's in the water and you can date that and you can date these organic bits of pollen themselves. So you can get a pretty tight date on uh, where to put those lines on the column on the, on the tube that you see in the upper left. And what does it give you? Well, over time, and this is Nelson Lake in Kane County, the relative abundance of pollen at a specific level allows you to infer paleoecology at any point in time or in sequence. So this one takes it back to 17,000 years ago at Nelson Lake. You can see uh, sedges uh, right after the glaciers receded, followed by spruce tree pollen, and then an increase of some deciduous tree pollen of, uh, <laughs> excuse me, ash and birch and alder and elm and then oak, and oak is a very prolific pollinator, so it always looks like there's more than there is. But then on the right in gold there, you can see the, the uh, emergence of grass pollens, of poaceae, and of ragweed, uh, ambrosia. And what does that mean? How does that look on the ground? Well, let's take a quick look. 
So environmental history, just to give you an idea, I took this picture of the uh, Pesternitsa Glacier in Australia, in between or Austria, I'm sorry, no glaciers in Australia, uh, between 1875 and 2004. And you can see just how quickly this geology and environment changes, where there was a glacier in 1875, you see in 2004, it's, it's pretty green. And that happens pretty rapidly, rapidly when the glacier recedes. So in our area, somewhere post 21,000, 18,000 years ago, depending if you're talking LaSalle or Medellin, uh, we had a tundra. So dry, very cold, uh, mostly non-vascular plants. And gradually over time, we came to something that looked more like a taiga. It started to get wetter. Uh, the ground unfroze. We started to have trees appearing. And I put an article, link to an article in there about uh, the difference between a taiga and a tundra for uh, those of you who are really into it. And uh, you'll see a lot of links throughout the presentation tonight. Uh, if you need to get those because they went past too quickly, please let me know. And I also uh, asked uh, Donna to post an article about specifically the LaSalle area and uh, pre-European American arrival and environmental management there. So after we had the uh, tundra and then taiga, we had a boreal forest, mostly spruce, 14 to 13,000 years ago. And as it continued to warm, and it warmed, uh, it continued to warm after that. And about 14,000 years ago at Medewin, we had a, a, an environment that we have never seen that doesn't exist nowadays. It's a black ash and spruce swamp environment. And uh, that was the time of the proboscideans, of the mammoths and the mastodons, also, you know, giant beavers, giant sloths, uh, and for some reason, uh, swans. And we don't know why. I've talked to a couple of the paleontologists. And nobody quite can figure that out, but they seem relatively abundant in the uh, paleontological record. Great painting uh, by uh, Simonovsky from the Illinois State Museum. Uh, he does great work. Chris Widga also, who had been at Illinois State Museum, writes a lot about proboscideans and ancient bison populations. Uh, did this article in 2017. And I thought, you know, I always thought this bison, ma mammoth and mastodon sites were something rare in Illinois. Well, it turns out that in their study trying to determine population dynamics when they went extinct, if you will, uh, they were able to get 659 specimens from the Midwest and then I talked to Chris about it, and he said, well, that's 659 specimens that, A, were in good enough condition that we could extract uh, radiocarbon dates from them, and B, that the owners of those specimens were willing to let us do the minimally destructive but nonetheless destructive uh, testing where you have to take the collagen from those bison bones. So there's a heck of a lot more than 659 throughout the Midwest sites that are known. So... Uh, you can get this article, you can look up Boreas, Lake Pleistocene Proboscidean, or Boreas, Chris Widga, and you can read this article for free. Really neat about uh, some insights into uh, early history of the Midwest. Continue to get warmer, continue to get wetter, and somewhere around 13,000 years ago, we had here a temperate deciduous hardwood forest. Uh, replace the spruce, replace the spruce and, spruce and black ash swamps. Uh, but there's no bison. So despite what I had been taught in uh, seventh grade and uh, throughout high school, uh, people got here long before the bison. And bison arrived in the state of Illinois about 4,450 years ago is the uh, er when continuous presence of bison appears. Uh, the earliest records of people here go back, hmm, let's call it 12,000 years ago. And during the Paleo-Indian period, people were thought to be uh, the opposite of sedentary, to be widely ranging hunters of large animals, whether that be bison or, or uh, st stag elk, mammoths and mastodons, giant sloths, as years went on, prairie elk, uh, then bison and deer. But, uh, but what happened in that artifact you see in the lower left, is a uh, actually the base of a projectile point. The tip on the left is broken off. And why is that important? Well, it's the oldest artifact from the day when, and it is a base of a Dalton fluted projectile point. 
and Gregory Perino's 1985 book on three volume work on uh, projectile points throughout the US uh, shows what a complete one looks like, kind of a serrated edge, uh, those kind of a fish tail base to it and a concavity at the base where it was hafted onto a shaft. Now, why is that different? How is that different? Well, there's a paleo Indian point, that black projectile point with a ruler showing inches, which was found just a year or two ago, uh, right before COVID, someone brought that into our welcome center and asked me to ID it. And it's a paleo Indian point pre 10,000 years ago. Well, you still got the fish ears and the base of the, uh, the uh, concave base and the uh, fluting where it was hafted onto a shaft. But the difference between Dalton points and uh, Paleo Indian points are one of the big differences is they are not made from local material. So the thought being that the people who made this projectile point base in the lower right would have been what we can think of as the first full time Illinoisans. They were not uh, wi as widely ranging. They were learning how to master the materials that were available to them locally. And Dalton points are usually made with local lithic or stone materials. So you're looking at something uh, from one of the first Illinoisans in the lower right. So really exciting. And the reference to read more about that is uh, Brad Koldehoff and uh, Tom Label's 2009 work. So climate continued to get warmer and slightly drier now, however, and we started to get more poaceae, although still dominance of uh, more grasses, but still a dominance of uh, tree pollens. So uh, 8,500 to 7,500 years ago, roughly, we had uh, mostly forest and then a brief cooler wetter period. I say brief 500 years, you know, environmental terms, climate terms, that's that's a blink of an eye, but it got cooler again, and we saw a decrease in grasses. And the, the uh, environmental record says uh, we had a resurgence of kind of closed forest environment during that time. Well, finally, around 6,000 years ago, drier, warmer climate and uh, grass or poaceae pollen overtakes tree pollen and prairie grassland becomes the dominant ecosystem. So by this time, and again, despite what Joe Wheeler had been taught as a boy, although that was many, many decades ago, uh, by this time, people had been living on what had been a forested land for 4,000 years. So it was different than I thought. And after the prairie arrives roughly 6,000 years ago, it's another at least 1,500 years before bison arrive and become a permanent presence on that prairie. But something else also happened to the people who had been living in the forest for 4,000 years. And uh, then they're faced with this completely different environment. They're faced with uh, environmental change and how do they adapt to it? And we always like to think of, oh, you know, big bad human beings, and it's mostly true, you know, had, had changed and modified the environment. Well, in this case, what happened was the environment changed people, or at least the way that people lived. About a thousand years after the prairie got here uh, and supplanted the forest, we saw the emergence of what's called the Eastern Agricultural Complex. And they went from hunting and gathering to horticulture and perhaps what we would think of as agriculture. These are some of the early sites uh, that are considered to be part of the Eastern Agricultural Complex. Riverton on the Wabash, one of the big sites in Illinois and Coster on the Mississippi, another big site for Illinois. Uh, you can read about the Riverton culture at the Illinois Archaeological Survey. That's kind of our union, if you will, union guild. They have a nice site and it includes out of print publications. And that, in, that includes this Riverton culture uh, study Winters did in 1969. Interesting download. Also, if you're interested in the history of domestication of plants in Northeast uh, America, uh, Northeast United States, you just have to look at Bruce D. Smith in the Smithsonian. He is uh, the preeminent researcher on agriculture in Northeastern North America and the history thereof. What's the first thing we had? Well, it wasn't corn. It was Kenopodium. Actually, uh, we would call it, it was a subspecies of what we call goosefoot or lamb's quarters, a Kenopodium, which coincidentally is a close relative to quinoa. So before we had quin uh, corn in Illinois, we had 
quinoa. People were eating a lot of that. We also had squash and pumpkins uh, were cultivars in this early uh, suite of cultivars. Uh, sunflower, as you might guess, was an early cultivar. And although it ranges a little further south, it's more common to the other sites. We're kind of on the edge, LaSalle and Mendewin, of the Eastern Agricultural Complex area, which may in fact just be because we haven't found caches of seeds to support it yet. But uh, Marsh Elder, which has a little bit more southerly range, you can see by that picture in the lower right-hand corner, those are little bitty seeds, and it's going to take one heck of a lot of them to constitute a good meal. So uh, that's part of it. You can see the difference in the types of seeds that are cultivated and those that are feral or wild. So the domesticate seeds of marsh elder are much larger as are sunflower, as are squash seeds. And the kinopodium has a thinner akeen. You saw that black uh, seed covering that was uh, uh, peeling off in the previous photo. You get a better look at it in this one. So. The plants themselves were modified and it kind of takes us to the edge of agriculture rather than horticulture. Uh, and we're growing a lot of that throughout Illinois at the time. Well, this continues in about another second wave of uh, the second wave comes about 2000 years ago. Uh, by 2000 years ago, it's a wreck knotweed comes into the suite of cultivars. This is not Japanese knotweed, which you're probably trying to get rid of in your garden. May grasses, also small seeds and a little more southerly range. Little barley and uh, amaranthus. So there's a lot of things that people are growing. And the interesting part, the really interesting part about this to me as an archaeologist is every one of these species <laughs> prefers disturbed ground. They're ruderal species and they grow on waste ground after fires and floods. So uh, what their evidence seems to be pointing towards right now is that uh, people were actively burning and managing this prairie environment in order to create ground that these seeds would thrive on and to grow their crops. So it was not happenstance. It was not random. It was not you know, the, this kind of simple depiction that we often give of, of uh, Native American hunting and gathering life. It was pretty sophisticated, pretty developed. So, you know, they were people with agency. They were people who figured out how to live on a land that was no longer forested as it had been for the first 4,000 years that they were in the area. What else? Okay, this is one of those side stories. If, you're, if, you, if you binge any TV shows, you know there's always a, a side theme, a side plot going on. So let's go back 10,000 years ago. Teosinte, which is the ancestor of modern corn or maize, begins to show up in the Balsas Valley of Mexico. They look pretty unpromising as far as a food grain over there in the lower right. They've only got about, you know, six to eight, seven to 10 uh, little seeds and they shatter when the uh, they shatter. They're not attached really to a cob as we would think of it today, certainly, but it really looks unpromising. But for some reason, people stuck at it and it turned out that maize was uh, amenable to manipulation. So as of about 10,000 years ago in Oaxaca, uh, or I'm sorry, in the Balsas Valley, we had grains or we had starches found in the archaeological record from sea maize from native maize in oaxaca about 6200 years ago they had modified it enough so that cobs of corn begin to appear little bitty things but still corn nonetheless begins its relentless march to dominate the uh north america enters the U.S. The earliest we found is five sites in eastern Arizona, western New Mexico, about 4,100 years ago. It enters southwestern, it enters the Midwest at a site in southwestern Missouri about 1,800 years ago. And about 1,000 years ago, it appears first in the archaeological record in Illinois. Uh, interesting article. I think, of course, I may have a different opinion of what's interesting than you do, but I think it's really interesting. One of the preeminent archaeoethnobotanist in the nation is Mary Simon. Uh, she reanalyzed an earlier specimen that she had from the holding site. And we had thought that maize entered Illinois about 2,000 years ago. But upon reanalysis, 
It entered about a thousand years ago and very soon before the rise of Cahokia. If I had a live audience, I'd ask you to raise your hand if you've ever been to or heard of Cahokia. But Cahokia was uh, kind of the, it was the metropolitan area of all of what's now the United States about the year 1000 to roughly the year 1400. It was huge. When corn arrives, uh, and these uh, specimens I have here, these ZMA's cobs, it's what early corn cobs looked like. It's from the site that uh, University of Notre Dame had uh, excavated on the day when this is what corn looked like uh, at this site on the day when about the year 1600. Uh, these cobs were about as long as if you bend your thumb, it would be the tip of the tip of your thumb, about as big as the part that's horizontal on the screen there. Uh, I also put up the map on the right to show where this American bottom, where it entered is, where Cahokia is and the first corn specimens that are pre-Cahokia are from. Well, Cahokia had about, covered about 4,000 acres at a population metro area of about 20,000. It was not, there was not a larger city in what's now the United States until Philadelphia in the year 1800. It had the Grand Plaza, which covered about this area of 35 football fields. You can see in the upper left and lower right the uh, type of artwork that was produced there. And in the middle of it, what still stands is Monk's Mound. It's about 100 feet high on a 14 acre base. It is made up of about 955,000 cubic yards of soil. So how much is that, Joe? I can see your I can't see your faces, but I know that's a burning question. So uh, a 955,000 cubic yards of soil, if you wanted to move it, would take 14,722 40-foot end dump loads. If you're doing it by bushel basket, which is how they would have been doing it, it would have taken 20 million, you know, edging up towards 21 million bushel baskets. And more recent archaeological research suggests the whole thing was built in less than 45 years. So 21 million baskets of soil moved to form this monk's mound you see here in less than 45 years. That's the window, not the actual construction dates. The trade networks extended throughout what's now the United States and beyond. Uh, Shell uh, and uh, Shell and shark teeth came from the Chesapeake, found at Cahokia, copper from the Michigan UP, obsidian from uh, obsidian cliffs in Yellowstone in Wy Northwest Wyoming, lightning whelk, which is a marine species of uh, shell found on the Gulf Coast, and also evidence of black draft ceremonialism, which was popular pre Cahokia in the American Southeast. So it was very, very metropolitan. And those networks persisted even after Cahokia uh, declined. And uh, we found, again, these are from the uh, Huber phase site, which dates to about 1600 on the day when we find hematite, which would have been from closer to central Illinois. We found these Oneata tradition uh, ceramics, as well as corn beans and squash, which didn't come up the Illinois, but came, excuse me, down from Northeast Iowa, most likely in the Oneata tradition. And there's a piece of lightning whelk on the right. That chunk is about as big as your hand. And it was found in a kind of a dust layer of uh, the calcium dust of, of where they had ground the shell to make other things with it. So they had a little workshop that they located, that Notre Dame located. And then there's a couple of brass, which since uh, Native Americans didn't smelt metal, that would have been very, very early trade stuff. They probably, it's down the line trade, had never seen a European, never seen a Frenchman or a European American but this trade came down from the St. Lawrence uh, and made its way to little old Medewin in southwestern Will County. Uh, quite recent study, don't put it in the science books yet. Uh, you can get the copy of this at sciencedirect.com, Quaternary Science Review. And in that, the uh, uh, authors who are all out of the UK uh, made some projections about uh, the decline in Native American populations being materially responsible for the uh, for changes in the environment, uh, global, global warming. You see it changes, I'll talk about this. A lot of words on this one. 
but uh, they looked at historic changes in atmospheric CO2 in the context of declines after Europeans arrived, European Americans arrived, and the great dying took place. Their estimates, and this is where a lot of the contention will come from, were that there may have been as many as 60 and a half million people in the Americas, North and South America at the time, uh, 1492, when Columbus arrived, estimated that they had about 153 million acres under cultivation. And I put a little asterisk there at the bottom, uh, that would be all the farmland in Illinois, Indiana, Wisconsin, Iowa, Michigan, Ohio, Missouri, and Kentucky combined. Well, after the great dying, they postulate the population declined to about five and a half million throughout the Americas, a 90% decrease, and the, the cropland decreased to about 15 billion acres, 15 million acres, and that uh, about 55, almost 56 million hectares became reforested. And that reforestation affected global atmospheric CO2 and lowered global temps by 0.15 degrees centigrade. So the hypothesis being Native American uh, population decreases as a result of European diseases ultimately res resulted in the first man human induced global climate change. Uh, there's a great article. So the bigger question it raises is we're restoring a prairie the environment changed around 2000 years ago and became cooler. We are still fighting woody invasives constantly at Medewin as all of us are. Buckthorn, honeysuckle, autumn olive, which is another one of the really pernicious uh, non-natives that we fight. And it's really prime for it because the environment since about 2000 years ago has been cooler and wetter than it had been when this became prairie. So raising the possibility that maybe the prairie that we're trying to restore was at the time that European Americans first saw it, it was at least some degree human managed and human created in the first place. I have an asterisk there because I gave an article uh, to Donna and asked her to post it by uh, Professor Robert Michael Morrissey, uh, professor uh, historian at University of Illinois, a lot of environmental uh, nods to environmental analysis, paleoenvironmental analysis, as well as archaeology. Terrific article, and his focus is on that prehistoric land management in the area right around LaSalle, Starved Rock, all within a few minutes drive. And if uh, she would post, it's really, really, really interesting. Next thing that happened, I'm gonna check my time here. Okay, still good. Uh, so European Americans arrived, and this is the famous uh, depiction from the Library of Congress of American progress. As American progress uh, moves forward from uh, east to west, and uh, the Native Americans and the bison and the bear on the left in the kind of darkness are pushed further in the darkness as progress arrives with miners and stage uh, stagecoaches and Conestoga wagons, Pony Express riders and farmers. And helpfully, you see American progress uh, underneath the book in her hand is uh, carrying a, a coil of telegraph wire, which probably made it a lot easier, I guess, when they were running telegraph wire from east to west in the country. But uh, so we have uh, European Americans arrive here. This is Township 33, Range 1, east of the third principal meridian. You might know it better as LaSalle Township the 36 four mile township, which includes the town of LaSalle. The center of section 10 there, <laughs> right at the edge of the woods along the Little Vermilion. Uh, the center of that would be about Vincent and Roosevelt streets. And in this way, when in the 1820s, uh, really it lasted a little longer, but uh, a big push from what 1815 to 1835 ish, when all of uh, the government land office contracted surveyors came out and surveyed all of Illinois and uh, kind of divided it up like you would the world's largest brownie sheet into uh, one square mile and then further into quarter mile and then half section. These mile square miles are called sections and uh, you can get a quarter mile, 160 acre quarter section half of a quarter is 80 acres or a quarter quarter, which is the traditional what you hear of the 40 acres, 40 acres and a mule. So uh, all of that was enabled by surveyors putting these 
kind of invisible lines on the ground so that it could be sold by the government and draw settlers to the West. This is from uh, the Kendall County Record, 1897. It's a uh, reminiscence of Rufus Gray, got, here, got to Kendall County in 1835. And he talks very specifically about the difficulties the farmers had in the early days on the prairie. And uh, the second paragraph particularly about this survey effort. And that was one of the big difficulties. Uh, early settlers had to contend with the land not being surveyed, which caused considerable problems in establishing boundaries between claimants, numerous fights. It's June 1835, we had a great sale, great land sale from LaSalle County South, and the settlers' claims were respected. And he also recount, accounts something that's very commonly read about, it's common in the historical record, which was someone who tried to come in and get some cheap land if there was already somebody squatting on it because there were no legitimate land sales on that land, uh, they would be knocked down, uh, literally or figuratively, to uh, allow the settlers who were already there to keep, keep hold of their claims and get it from the federal government a dollar and a quarter an acre. So to give you an idea of the scope and scale, so 36 square mile townships, LaSalle Township being one of them, uh, broken into 36 uh, individual square mile sections. On the right side, you can see how it could be divided. Most of the early claims in Illinois were 80 acre, half of a quarter section. Uh, but between 1805 and 1855, mostly 1815 to 1835, GLO surveyors recorded uh, and created this network of 36 square mile townships, 1400 of them, over 1400 of them in Illinois, and surveyed a grand total of almost 58,000 square miles of Illinois. So a huge undertaking and really opened and drew people to the old Northwest Territory uh, to settle the land after statehood in 1818. Mostly Illinois was only settled in the South at the time of 1818 when we became a state. Uh, so market developments. What do you plant when you first get to a place? Uh, the traditional frontier crop is wheat. So 1849, LaSalle County and Will County were both in the second quintile, second largest fifth of producers of wheat in the state of Illinois. By 1879, uh, we had both fallen, LaSalle County and Will County had both fallen down to the bottom quintile of wheat production. Oh my gosh. Well, LaSalle had a lot of things going for it, not only agriculture, but uh, the canal port, 1848, when the i &M canal was completed. Uh, also zinc uh, mining, uh, it had, and it was right on the route of a lot of transportation that was, that was forthcoming. Now let's look at corn production. Corn is notoriously harder to transport than wheat, bigger grains, you don't get as much in a in a bag of uh, corn as you do in a bag of wheat, and you can see that in 1849, uh, Illinois or in uh, LaSalle and Will County were at the bottom quintile of corn production. Most of the corn production taking place on the lower Illinois at that time, but by 1879, LaSalle was one of the top 20% uh, of wheat of corn producers in the state. Will County had other things going on, but we kind of bumped up to fourth quintile for by 1879 in production. What goes hand in hand with corn production? Swine production. Uh, 1849, LaSalle County went from fifth quintile, as was Will County. It went right up to seventh or second quintile in swine production. And this is an exciting thing. This is one of my favorite things to talk about. I get uh, passionate about the swine industry in Illinois. I know that sounds funny, but I do. Uh, Western Prairie Farmer, you can get a copy of 1841 to 1941, the complete run at the uh, University of Illinois Library at that site, IDNC. It's, I think it's the Illinois Digital Newspaper Collection, I think is what the IDNC stands for. You can also get the uh, Ottawa Free Trader from 1840. 1890, that's the local paper that they have archived there. But uh, one of the great things the Prairie Farmer given advice to uh, people in Northeast Illinois was uh, it seems to us uh, farmers of settlement to unite and to drive their hogs to market. 
If there be a hundred or more, it will cost less than less than to take pork in wagons, besides having it more sale in a more saleable condition. It cannot well be taken very far without getting more or less dirty. And then in cold weather, it is frozen, which packers wish to avoid. We have inquired and found hogs will be butchered here, thoroughly cleaned, delivered anywhere in town, the fat taken from the entrails and the whole given to the owner for 18 cents each. And uh, this great, great picture, uh, you can't perhaps see it uh, because of how small it is, but the sign kind of on the, it looks like a cross, almost like a, a like a religious cross, but it's, it says to Chicago. So you see this uh, wagon being held up by the swine, the hog drive that's taking place in the foreground there, taken in the Chicago market. Samuel Ruggles, New York politician and agricultural advocate, uh, described why they go hand in hand, corn and swine production. Corn thus becomes incarnate for what is a hog, if not 15 or 20 bushels of corn on four legs. So. And I am having trouble advancing my slide. There we go. So in many places in the United States, uh, Kansas, Texas, places like that, they have a legacy of the cowboy. You know, a lot of movies about cowboys. Unfortunately, uh, this is a picture on the right of a hog drive bringing hogs into Cincinnati at the time. It was called Hogopolis. Uh, the same could have been shown, I'm sure, at many towns and cities uh, all along the Illinois River during the uh, early days of, uh, of Illinois. So that's our tradition here and, and I'm pretty darn proud of it. 1838, this is kind of what it looked like. You see not much transportation going on and uh, not even a uh, LaSalle. 1838, the map only depicts Rockwell, which was a speculative town that never went anywhere on the banks, north bank of the, uh, of the Illinois. We had the same thing just west of the, you'll see that yellow oval on the right. That's where, that depicts where Medewin is. And off to the left of that, it's Kankakee. It was another town. It shows up on the maps, but it never really existed in real life. It was a speculator's thing. You can see the displays and you can see the canal, which was 10 years from being completed in this 1838 map. And you can also see precious few roads, the stage line from Chicago to Plainfield to Lisbon, down to Ottawa, and then along the river to uh, uh, to Utica, where you could pick you could pick up the uh, canal boat, uh, at least as far as in 1840 at uh, Peru. Otherwise, you had to go all the way to Peoria in a wagon or a stagecoach. This is what happened by 1856: the railroads, uh, vast change. Uh, Rockwell disappears, and La Salle is is uh, in its place and multiple railroads in place. This happened extraordinarily quickly. When you think of 12 years to dig the I&M Canal, uh, in 18 years you had multiple railroads, uh, not proposed, but actually in business and operating, as well as the canal traffic on the Illinois River. So great, uh, great uh, economic transformation that happened. Stockyards open, and I just love it for the statistics, of course, that hogs are driven there, cattle are driven there, uh, and the Union Stockyard, which was just a transit yard, uh, nine railroads served it. It didn't buy, sell, or process anything, but it had bonded commission agents, and you could, by 1870s, Swift had introduced the first practical refrigerated rail cars, and take a look at the growth or the number, the volume of uh, livestock that they ran through there. 1,800,000 cattle, 5,700,000 hogs, 8 million sheep processed. And at one time, 80% of America's meat came from the Chicago stockyards. Much of it fed on Illinois corn. Other big thing uh, that helped the industry benefited both LaSalle and everything up the river, grain elevators. Uh, grain elevators developed and they changed the sex of grain mentality into a bulk commodity and it made it a lot more efficient in production. In 1838, uh, Chicago handled 78 bushels of grain. By 1848, 10 years later, the year the i &M was completed, it handled 2.16 million bushels of wheat alone, although it was still all in sacks. 1858, first grain elevators. By 1868, 
10 elevators with a capacity of 10 and 10 million 680,000 bushels. And by 1891, they were handling 66 and a half million bushels of corn alone, followed by 60 and 68 million of oats, 20 million of rye, barley, and other. And it dropped at that point, Illinois had dropped to only pushing up less than 40,000 bushels of wheat running through the uh, Chicago at the time. And finally, what I the corn is king, we'll get off of that topic, centennial history of Illinois, as it used to be said in the southern states before the Civil War, the cotton is king. So it might be with equal truth be said of Illinois during this period that corn is king. So uh, a great book on the transformation of the Illinois, Illinois agriculture is bottom left, Alan Bogues, uh, great and very readable prairie to corn belt farming in the Illinois and Iowa prairies in the 19th century. Uh, terrific book, uh, kind of a page turner. If it's if you're even mildly interested in it, it's a, it's a good book. What did that mean to Medewin? Well, this is what Medewin looked like in 1939, shortly before the Joliet Arsenal started buying up land, uh, the army started buying up land. You can see by those uh, multi-shaded shades of black rectangles, it was all farm country. There was nothing else going on on the, on the land of Medewin other than agriculture. And uh, it was a great period of kind of a heightened agriculture because people were working their doing their best to work their way out of the Great Depression. So as of 1939, uh, the locations, we knew the United States was going to be increasing defense production and didn't know where the plants would be built, but uh, in Will County, the Joliet Association of Commerce, the forerunner of the Chamber of Commerce, sent lobbyists to Washington, D.C. to try and get uh, plants uh, in their area, in Will County. And why, did, why do you pick it? Well, from Joliet's perspective, from Will County's perspective, perspective, we had the highest number of people in the state on relief, and we had a lot of farms that had underwater mortgages. So uh, uh, it was certainly in the interest of Will County to do that. The Army, in a very practical way, looked at flat, inexpensive land, the availability of flat, inexpensive land, nearby transportation. And we had a lot of rail, a lot of roads, and we had the uh, displains and the headwaters of the Illinois nearby. They also needed a lot of water for the production of munitions. Uh, it had to be 200 miles from a foreign border, check. And it had to have a large labor pool, but not so close that if something went wrong, you're going to have a you know, major catastrophe on your hands of munitions being manufactured in the uh, middle of the city. So we met all that. Kind of a timeline. And when I looked at this preparing for tonight, I, I kind of thought, uh, you know, it was a deja vu feeling uh, when I looked at this. It's just uh, unfortunate to say, but we're in, you know, trying times right now today. And uh, I, uh, you know, heartfelt, uh, heartfelt wishes that things uh, get back to normal for a lot of people in Eastern Europe and in Ukraine. 1939, Hitler invaded Poland. A week later, FDR declares a limited national emergency. 10th of May, the following year, France invades and funding becomes, France is invaded and funding becomes available to start buying land and building munitions plants. Shortly after that, the Battle of Britain begins. In September of 1940, we begin, the federal government begins to purchase land in Will County for the construction of these munition plants. Uh, so it predates Lend-Lease, which didn't take effect until March of 1941. Here's a picture of what, uh, it's the best picture we have, not the first one, but in 1954, it was still a munitions plant. And you can see that transformation from all of those farm parcels. Outside the black outline of Medewin, you can see it's still uh, agricultural, and inside it's all uh, bunker fields and uh, kind of the diagonal uh, and lower right-hand part of uh, the land is the load assemble and package plants for munitions uh, loading. On the left-hand side, uh, on the west, you can see is, uh, and I'm going to, I hope, I don't know if my cursor shows up on your screen. I hope it does. But these uh, vertical lines are uh, storage bunkers for TNT. If you look just to the north of them, it's not part of Medewin today, but that was the TNT, DNT, and Toluene production facilities in Lead Azide. 
the government bought uh, 36,000 acres of land. If you're more into square miles than acres, that's over 57 square miles. They paid over $8 million for it, which would be about $232 million today, bought 450 parcels of land. And in the course of that, they caused 229 farm families to move. There are also nine church, nine schools, two churches, five cemeteries, uh, and one bar on the land. Uh, so the farmers, in many cases, you know, they cribbed up, uh, propped up, and loaded onto wheels the uh, houses and moved them to new locations. The army moved some, and some of them were made available to uh, be cannibalized either by the owners or they could put them up and get money from cannibalization where they'd rebuild them or just use the lumber someplace else. Interesting cultural shifts associated with this. Not an employable man in Joliet or Will County would be out of work if I can do anything. This goes for people on relief and the WPA and the farmers and the colored people too. Tony Augustino, uh, union, uh, local 75, labor's union president in 1940. Uh, the Joliet Arsenal counted as two plants. The Kankakee Ordnance Works, which was TNT manufacturing on the west side and the Elwood Ordnance Plant, which was munitions assembly on the east side. And uh, they went right to it. And it happened extraordinarily quickly from the early months of 1941, when the uh, purchases were completed until they came online by September of 1941, before we entered the war, both plants were in full operations. This is uh, the TNT lines being put in before they even had a chance to tear out the uh, Florence Rogers farmstead at the bottom in the foreground. So pretty common. For over 400 of these bunkers that you see on the left, we have over 300 of them still intact. They put up over 1,100 major structures, 166 miles of rail, and put in 93 new miles of roads over 72 miles of previous farm roads, and 101 miles of water pipes. So that's just the Gee whiz statistic, that's a 42 inch water pipe on the truck at right. 17,000 construction workers uh, employed. And uh, as Abraham Lincoln said in the second, uh, second inaugural address and the war came and uh, both plants were up and operating in time for that by September of 1941. At its peak, the plant employed 21,000 people during the second world war. And uh, there's job recruiting on the left, and there were jobs put aside for local local folks displaced. Uh, but that 229 families worth of people working came nowhere near to 21,000 folks. You can also see the large number of women in the workforce at the time. First, it was thought there's a caption on the photo left says women are going to be employed in these, you know, making small parts and sub assembly things far from the munitions. But by the end of the war, February 1945, uh, April 1945, so spring of 45, women held a quarter of the total jobs in the operations, not administration, but operations, TNT manufacturing uh, and bomb mine and uh, explosives assembly. And for women in 1945, their operators in the block plant were promoted to foremen. So a huge social change that was going on. Another social change, and this is not an unalloyed good news story, uh, African-Americans in the workforce. Elwood, uh, both the plants were very proud that this was a, a place where what in 1943 was counted as equality. People had good paying steady jobs. Uh, there were no separate water fountains, no separate canteens or cafeterias or change houses. Uh, it was, however, segregated. This is a picture of uh, all African-Americans. Uh, so it was segregated, unloading bombs. But again, uh, coming out of the depression, after the great migration from the South, these are good, steady paying, uh, well-paying well and steady jobs. And also semi-skilled work, Elwood Ordnance Plant. These are all seamstresses in the shop repairing the uh, overalls that the employees uh, had to wear when they were working around the uh, munitions and assembly plants. So all told, they produced a billion pounds of TNT, 26 million artillery shells in 105 millimeter caliber, 46 million TNT blocks, you can see lower right, uh, six and a half million anti-tank mines, uh, well over a million bombs ranging from 250 pounds to 4,000 pounds, 
as well as untold millions of fuses, boosters, primers, detonators, relays, and millions of pounds of dinitrotoluene, lead azide, and other uh, chemicals used for the war effort. It was reopened after being shut in 1945 for the Korean War, 51 to 57, 1966 to 76 for the Vietnam War, TNT production ceased in 75, and by the end of the century, very much uh, had fallen into disuse and disrepair. The Army wanted to divest itself of it. And in 1996, the land of the arsenal was divided amongst six owners. The dark green is what is today Medewin. Uh, Abraham Lincoln National Cemetery along Illinois Route 53 in the kind of medium green there on the upper part. Deer Run Industrial Center or Center Point Industrial on the uh, yellow rectangle. Joliet, the Army retained some land as a reserve training ground in the north, which it still holds, and in the south, the Will County Landfill and an industrial park. We got between 18 and 20,000 acres, uh, which includes some in holdings that are still being remediated and turned over to us. This is 2003, one of the byproducts of TNT production was what was called red water. And for decades until the Environmental Protection Act took effect, it was just dumped into the ground afterwards. And that's the groundwater table exposed in 2003. You can see that kind of rich oxblood uh, red, red water in the ground table. And on the right, you can see a plastic line dump truck as they're clearing out some of this stuff the army paid for. And there are still ongoing remediation efforts, not quite this egregious or this dramatic as there had been in the early years but the army is still slowly remediating and turning over parcels of land to us that's ongoing. We'll be up to about 20,000 acres when that process is completed. So 26 years into a hundred year project, it's your government that's doing it. And it makes me so proud. Uh, I had been a Marine for 30 years, retired and went back to graduate school to become an archeologist. And however, one of the proudest things is that we are funding an effort that none of us will ever leave, live to see to fruition. Uh, that is the restoration of the tall grass prairie. We work with many partners, uh, nature advocacy and corporate partners. We depend on many volunteers and we do this all with roughly 25 full-time permanent forest service employees. And uh, there's a winter brush company volunteer event there. We have about 5,200 acres restored of the 18,000 acres uh, and uh, either fully restored or under restoration. And then of course, maintenance is a big effort to keep that up so it doesn't just get all those plants moved back in. And that's it. And let me see, I am two minutes over and Donna is not cut me off. So uh, I will stop sharing my screen. There's how to get a hold of me how to get a hold of Veronica, who's on the uh, chat box. And uh, she's our public affairs officer there at Medewin. And uh, that's, that's all I got. Donna? Well, that was plenty, Joe, really. Um, <laughs> Too much, and I'm I, sorry. I love your timing. It, that was <laughs> extremely informative. Actually, I had written some questions down for you and you answered all of them. So I'm yeah. at a loss here. Um, <laughs> I, I, uh, I've lived in Illinois my entire life. I had no idea all this was going on, but I don't think I'm the only one. At least I hope I'm not. Well, so good. this was uh, an eye opener and uh, much to learn. And I'm, I'm glad I was present for it. Uh, for folks in this area, remember that Medewin is just an hour away. So this is a place you should go as the weather is breaking and uh, Maybe run into Joe while you're out there and, and cover further questions. If you have any questions now, please put them in the chat and we'll make sure that we get Joe to answer them before we sign off for the night. As I'm scrolling up through it, I have an apology to Laura Hiltebrand, uh, never zinc mining in LaSalle County, right? The zinc smelter in. So thank you for correcting me, Linda. Uh, always appreciate getting it right. So thank you. And we as the library always appreciate getting it right too. <laughs> yeah. Um, for those who are interested but not near enough by Medaven, uh, as you saw in the chat, Veronica was posting upcoming virtual programs. You can check their website, um, Facebook, and of course, don't forget to check the Bison Cam um, 
always a, a treat when they're there to see them. Uh, all these resources that Joe spoke of and that um, Veronica was putting in the chat will be posted with the recording of this program tomorrow. Um, and uh, if you have any questions after we sign off, please send them to us at the library and we will forward them on and get you the information that you need. I believe that's it. Are there any other questions in the chat? All right then. So Joe, I want to thank our audience for being with us tonight and thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. So informative. And with and that, I'd like to turn it back to you for final comments. Just uh, thank you very much for bearing with me. I tried to stuff, uh, you know, three hours worth of material into one hour. I appreciate your bearing with me. And uh, seriously, uh, you know, not just saying it because I'm sitting here wearing a Forest Service uniform with an arm patch, but uh, we really do love to have the people who pay for, who host uh, the day when, whether to come out to visit, to volunteer, just to enjoy your public land. Uh, and, uh, you know, kind of gets us pumped when we start to see visitors again uh, after a long time of, uh, you know, being somewhat reduced in our public, uh, you know, public presence in person. So come on out and see us in person. And uh, we'd be glad, glad to have you. And again, thanks for your patience. Thanks for being a great audience. Uh, and Donna, thank you. Did you did you post that article we talked about? It will all be posted by tomorrow. All right. Thanks. And, and contact me if you have anything that went too fast to find out a source on something I said. So okay. uh, talk to you soon. Thank you and good night. Thank you. thank you again, Joe. And thank you to everyone who was here tonight. Um, and with that, we'll say good night.